Welcome to this talk about uh, multimedia support in, in WebKit. So as you can see, the title is a bit different from what you have in the schedule, uh, but it still applies to all, all I, what I would talk about will apply to, to WebKit GTK still. But for this talk, I will focus more on, on WP. So I will explain why it is as well. So who am I? I've been uh, a gestionary contributor for, for a few years already. And um, as you can see, I have a double. Uh, I'm part of two communities mainly, WebKit and GStreamer. So I, I contribute code to, to both communities. And uh, my main interest in, in GStreamer is related with uh, media playback. So I work at a um, worker-owned uh, cooperative called Igalia. Um, we are around 70 Igalians nowadays uh, around the world. Um, and we provide software consulting uh, services to, to companies around, mm -hmm. around projects such as WebKit and, and GStreamer. So the agenda of the talk, um, I will briefly explain what is WPE, um, give uh, a brief overview of, of how it works. Um, I will explain the basic infrastructure related with media playback in WebKit that is used by uh, the other things that follow, such as adaptive streaming, um, WebRTC, media capabilities. And then if there's time, I, I will just give a, a brief, um, brief uh, use case about uh, using WP in, in IMX6 boards. Okay, so it starts with WP. It stands for Web Platform for Embedded. So it's, it's a WebKit port that we have been developing at Igalia. And its, it's main focus is around embedded devices. So in WebKit, there are ports that provide a public API for applications to be used. And uh, for instance, there's a port for GTK applications. There's a port for uh, Mac OS applications. And there used to be a port for Qt, but nowadays it's no longer there. So WP, in general, it's, it relies on the WebKit 2, which is now called WebKit uh, architecture, multiprocess architecture. So we have quite a few processes around there uh, doing IPC between each other. Um, but I will briefly just mention the, the three main ones. Uh, the, the data is collected from the network process and it goes to uh, a web process that will basically pass the DOM tree, and do the, the composite, the layers together of the page and output a, a final image that can be presented to the user. And it will also manage all the JavaScript stuff uh, in, in the web process. And then the, the, that composited image goes to the, to the UI process to be displayed by, uh, uh, to the application. And also in the UI process, there's some API exposed. Uh, but WP doesn't really uh, depend on any kind of toolkit widget. So we just provide the standard GDB API, which is shared with the GTK port as well. Um, so if there's no um, direct dependency on widgets, we need to provide to the application some kind of uh, rendering backend. And that's what uh, WP backend is about. Um, so, and it's, it's relying on, the, on a third party library that we, that we wrote. It's called WP. It used to be called WP backend, but it was a bit, a name a bit confusing. And it's not part of WebKit itself uh, yet. So maybe at some point in the future, it will be merged. Uh, it's not sure yet. So it, it provides some, some interfaces that uh, backends can implement. And those interfaces are used by the UI process, basically. So it gives us a lot of flexibility for, uh, to support a various, kind, various range of, uh, of uh, graphics drivers and, and platforms. So that's, uh, that's quite nice. Uh, it's, it's a bit different from the monolithic uh, layer where we had, uh, like, like for instance, where QGTK, uh, only depending on, on GTK. So now we have a, a bit more flexibility in that area. So WP provides uh, an interface called View Backend that is used by the, the web process. And it's mainly uh, outputting EGL images. So any, any platform that supports EGL should be able to, to to use WP. So we have one reference backend called WP F backend F FDO, <laughs> free desktop. 
So it relies on the Wayland EGL uh, API that was recently moved to, to Wayland out of MESA. And it uh, provides some cross-buffer, cross-process buffer sharing mechanism. So you can just, uh, uh, you have some basic API there to, to retrieve the EGL image composited by the web process and do whatever you want with it, like render it in, in, a, in, a, in a window or, or in the frame buffer directly. Uh, so we have three API uses, like EGL images, uh, Wayland resources. And in the future, we plan to also support lin Linux uh, DMA buff uh, descriptors. We, we use them internally right now uh, because it was a requirement for running in, 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 rest, in very recent uh, Western uh, versions. So histori historically, it was combined with MESA because that's where Wayland DGL is, was, and it works on, on, on desktop and embedded devices. I, I use it uh, and it works quite, quite well. Um, so the basic infrastructure for video playback now and web audio. So in green there, you can see uh, what's new and all, all that remains is what was existing before already. So we, we rely a lot on the Playbin uh, elements for playback. So we have, a, for, we have a, a base class for a video rendering, basically. It's called Media Player Private Base, and it provides all the mechanism to, to, to do the video rendering. We added support for Playbin 3 recently. Um, it's still, uh, for it, it works with for basic video playback, uh, but not yet for all the features we support, like MSC. I will talk a bit more about that later. So we implemented stream collections, and it's, it's quite convenient for us. It's really a, 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 good, uh, a good match for, for WebKit. And we do the, the video rendering in, in GL. We have a, a custom app sync which behaves a bit like uh, GL image sync, basically. Um, we don't use GL image sync. We, at, at the beginning, we, we were using it, but it has some features like it internally manages a window, which kind of was not really useful for us. So that's why we decided to, to use an, an app sync. Uh, we had a support for fast malloc, which is uh, a custom allocator, memory allocator used in WebKit. So it's based on bmalloc, and it's uh, basically uh, m mapping uh, a wide region in memory and trying to uh, uh, do some smart things there for memory allocations. So we have a, a custom GC allocator for that. And yeah, we, we used to have um, support for the codec installer in WebKit, so we were um, able to um, when we, when a video was played and there was no decoder for it, we, we used to have some, some uh, pop-up showing up, for instance, in the GNOME browser for, for installing codecs. Uh, but now it's kind of useless because we, we build a, a whitelist of uh, MIME types coming from WebKit uh, mapping to uh, GStreamer decoders, uh, CAPS templates, basically. Um, and yeah, recently we added support for AV1. It was um, a simple patch. And uh, <laughs> uh, so we support AV1 if you have a, a, already a decoder, such as the a AOM decoder uh, in BAD, I think it is. And uh, I, I had AV1 decoding working out of the box with that, only with a free line patch. So it was quite, quite, uh, quite nice to have. Uh, web audio, so that's, that's an, uh, a a specification of the web that allows to applications to have um, a low latency live audio playback. So it's not like the audio element itself. Uh, we have been we have that back end like for years already. I, I talked about it in previous general conferences, so I, I won't go into the details. But we have basically two two pipelines uh, used there: one for decoding, uh, for instance, MP3 MP3 files or even uh, yeah any kind of codec because we use DecodeBeam for that. Um, so to inject the raw data in, uh, in the pipeline, in the WebKit audio bus. And then for playback, we use a, a really simple uh, pipeline with a custom source element and some app sources um, uh, in, 
for each source pad of the element. And then we interleave. So at some point, we, we, we had some issues there. And I kind of started to rewrite that source element using the audio source base class. Um, but it's not finished yet. I hope to, to get that working at some point. And uh, we also would like to uh, use what's learning nowadays in GStreamer for the um, uh, plan audio support. So that could be quite interesting to use, I think. So there will be some more developments in, the, in that backend. So I have a few slides about that, about uh, tooling, because we, we spent a lot of time uh, debugging our applications. And um, I guess you, you know what GST debug is, what, what GST debug dump dot deer is. Uh, I don't know if you can, if you really like that. Uh, <laughs> so it's, in my opinion, uh, probably there's some room for improvement there. Um, there's GST debugger also. I think uh, the main author is there. I think I saw him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I use I use GST debugger, and I think it's uh, it's quite uh, an interesting project to follow, and um, there's uh, there's some really a good potential there for improving the, the tooling, the debug tooling. Um, there's also the tracers that we have uh, been at for a few years already. But what if you could have something more um, easy to, to, to use, such as uh, in WebKit, there's a thing called the web inspector where you can inspect web pages. Um, so I started recently to, to add a new, new tab in that inspector. Um, that would allow you to, to display the pipelines, for instance. And that that's, was quite simple to do. And it's simple and it's more, more nice. And I think that having to set some environment variables and, and converting some dot file to PNG. And then, so, but, so here we get the SVG data from the pipeline directly. You have a list of pipelines on the left. And you can select your pipeline. You can, that pipeline, I guess you don't see it. It's too small. But it's showing a MSC uh, play pipeline. Like that's the source element. I think it's playing VP9 and Opus. So that's just a prototype. It's not, uh, it's not upstream yet, and it's just an experiment. But I think uh, we could have something nice there and some nice UI to, to debug. Uh, and, and that should actually already working for remote devices, because you can use the web inspector in, on remote devices. It has some custom protocol, so uh, it's already quite in interesting to use, I think. So I just, just talking about uh, adaptive streaming. So my colleagues there, Alicia Voyan, Enrique Ocaña, and also Calvaris have been working on that quite a lot recently. So it provides adaptive streaming support for WebKit. So what, what, the, what that is, basically, uh, you have your application will, pro will try to push data to an object called source buffer. And usually you have one source buffer for audio, one source buffer for video. And uh, you have control, full control of the data being pushed on the application side. And, um, so in WebKit, we, we get that, dat that data. We put it in a pipeline called AppM pipeline, where we do all the, the we demux the, the data and pass it. And then we re-inject it into WebKit so that it can be managed at, at a different la layer of, the, of WebCore. And then for playback, we use uh, the, the existing infrastructure we had that I presented before. And we have uh, some uh, custom source element for that. So we did some improvements recently um, and to support, especially uh, web, web apps such as YouTube TV. So we had to uh, contribute quite a few changes in, in QDMX. That was Alicia's work mostly, um, and it was uh, very, very good to have. And, uh, and it, it summed up to 15 patches, or like more or less, I think. I've been looking at the Git logs, and uh, it's, it was uh, <laughs> interesting to, to have. It. So yeah, samples demuxing in push mode. Some features mainly related with push mode segment and link and uh, duration related fixes. I, I, I don't have the, all the details there, but uh, basically QDMUX now supports the, the MSC uh, style of, 
of operation. And we did the same for the Matroska Dimux for, for VP8 uh, and 9. So, but there, there was less work because it was working already quite well. So we, we only have a, a few free main changes we did with the, with the pad events, normal pads, and the multi-track and the fixes for WebM, the byte stream format. So with all these changes in GStreamer and WebKit, now we have uh, MSC enabled. Uh, we, we actually had to enable it re really recently because YouTube started to, to push to use MSC in their production servers. And uh, so if your browser didn't really support it well, uh, you, you didn't get any video playing. So we had to, to, to rush a bit on that. Um, but now we, we are quite happy with the results. And it's working on desktop, on platforms, on embedded platforms. And that's the desktop version and TV version using MSE nowadays. And it, they mostly use VP8, uh, no, VP9 and Opus, and H.264 when there's no VP9 decoder. Um, so on the to-do list for that backend, we have support for Playbin 3. Um, so we need to have the streams uh, the stream collection support in the source element we have for our player. And also we, uh, we plan to work on multi-track, so for videos supporting like uh, multi-audio tracks, for instance. I think there are still some, some fixes that are not upstream yet. So now let's move to WebRTC. The, that was mainly done by Thibaut Saunier and Alex Castro. Um, so what we did, we had uh, some kind of uh, <laughs> History there going on for years. Uh, just really, even before 2015, there were some, some experiments already done in WebKit uh, based on fast stream. And, uh, but then web, OpenWebRTC came. Uh, it was developed by Ericsson. And then the, it, the maintenance did fade away, and we, we had to remove that backend. And in the meantime, Apple uh, started integrating LibreWebRTC Li into, into WebKit. So they did all the, they added support for custom decoders and encoders in, 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 in that fork or LibreWebRTC. So yeah, that's why we, we chose to adopt it. Uh, so yeah, that's what's, well, what I was saying before. Um, LibreWebRTC currently is more, is quite a mature uh, code base. It's used in the main browsers, in Firefox, Chrome. And uh, it's quite feature complete. It supports a wide range of, uh, of, the, feature, of the specs uh, that are mandated by WebRTC. And they have a, there's a huge uh, development team, mainly by, by Google. And uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting project to follow right now. And so yeah, Apple already uh, did some integration there for, to, to enable their decoders. So we, we decided to, to use the same, uh, the same infrastructure. So, so we basically combined LibreWebRTC with GStreamer. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we, we implement support for the um, video source uh, and audio source monitoring using GStreamer, using the GST device monitor. And then from that monitor, we create source elements that provide uh, Raw, raw data or encoded data, depending on, on, what source, uh, on what camera you have. And then we use encode bin to be able to send data over the wire. And, uh, and on the, the receiving side, we use decode bin for the, for the playback. And we used a lot of AppSync and AppSource for that. We could have used the proxy element, I think. It would be a bit similar. Um, but yeah, AppSync and AppSource work quite well already. And yeah, the video playback is done using uh, that media player we have. Uh, and as you can see, we have quite a few source elements for that media player, depending on each backend. So we are able to reuse quite a lot of code there. And uh, yeah, so that's, we use currently LibreWebRTC, but there are some issues uh, mainly related with the licensing uh, model of Boring SSL that's, um, 
don't really enable us to, to have it shipped and enabled in, in GPL applications. So that's, that's kind of an interesting issue to have. Um, so and last year, even when WebRTC Bean was not released yet, it was in GitHub, I, I started uh, as an experiment uh, a WebKit backend for it. It was quite, quite easy to, to do. And uh, because the WebRTC Bean API matches perfectly the peer connection API, so uh, I think that could be interesting for the future to, to use at some point. We could have uh, something interesting there going on. So media capabilities is uh, another spec that is currently in development at the W3C. It's about um, querying the media decoding and encoding capabilities of uh, a browser before trying to play anything. Or so it's it's interesting as well. Um, there's so you have some really simple API that will be able to reason, return free booleans. Uh, supported, smooth, or power efficient. Um, it's really it's still the early stages, but uh, I'm not sure exactly how, how to support that in, in g There's a discussion in Bugzilla about that. Supported is quite easy, so if you have an, an encoder or decoder for that format, you, you are supported on that, but uh, there's some differences between smooth and power efficient that are at a bit beyond my understanding currently. So. <laughs> Uh, smooth, I think it means that if you have an, an hardware encoder or decoder, that you can set that flag to throw, basically. And power efficient, it's uh, related with the battery uh, DOM API. Um, but I'm not sure what to do with that one yet. I think I would just uh, leave it to false for now in the back end. So we have to, uh, the main, main things we have to do in GSMR for that uh, are listed there. I think, in my opinion. So we recently added a, a hardware metadata classifier into GST elements so that we can use the registry to, to query all the elements that have that classifier support uh, enabled. And then we, we can, depending on the, on the CAPS template, uh, we, can, we can say that that codec is hardware supported or not. And then, we, we, depending on each platform, we might need to have um, some kind of probing done uh, using a, a state transition. When we, f we go from null to ready, we could do some probing. Like, for instance, the V4L2 uh, decoder could, could do something like that, uh, I think, at some point. We should discuss that during the, the ACFest, I think. And, uh, yeah, the, another way to, to improve that is to refine a bit the, the CAPS templates. Uh, Without, uh, without breaking auto plugging. Uh, so that could be interesting to do as well. So uh, right now, I, I only did the first thing, uh, which is quite simple. It was a really simple patch. And yeah, I started the, the backend in WebKit as well. So I, I'm using the registry to, to scan uh, for encoders and decoders. And, uh, and I will set those, uh, those Boolean variables. <coughs> so now, Still have time, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we briefly talk about uh, a use case we have uh, at Egalia where we use uh, quite a lot of AMX6 platforms. Um, I have a Quad Plus and I use it with Yocto, but you can use it with BuildRoot or build your own SysRoot like uh, the collaborator people do with the, the boss. Um, but what I will talk about is related with Yocto. So you have we maintain at Igalia a layer called MetaWebKit where you can enable um, WP and any kind of backend because there are multiple backends besides the FDO backend. Um, and we have a really minimalistic Korg browser that it's showing basically full screen or in window mode. Uh, it's really basic stuff, but uh, it's quite efficient already. And there's a, a layer for GSM. So that's. The, the one maintained by OSS Systems is currently the most up-to-date uh, if you don't use uh, Pocky Master. So if you use Sumo or Roku, you should use uh, that layer. And then Meta Freescale for all the mainline kernel stuff. And, uh, so they have basically two options. Um, 
you have the proprietary boots, which is which means that you need to depend on, on the drivers provided by Freescale and NXP. And then you have, you have the choice there between a few, a few WP backends. So the RDK backend is a collection of uh, plugins, basically. It's, uh, it, it has a few things there. So one is uh, a kind of a plugin for, for Wayland. Another one is for the specific Viv IMX6. And it's, it's working on the, on the framework for device. And then you have the FDO backend, which is the one I use, and it's, it's usable in, in Western only. <coughs> and then for video playback, you use these just my IMX plugins uh, that provide hardware, uh, zero copy, decoding, and encoding. Uh, if you don't like that option of depending on the proprietary driver, you have the open source option um, using the Ednaviv reverse engineered driver. And that's the option I use. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's quite interesting. And uh, there's a lot of uh, nice work d being done there in that area. But you need to depend on really recent versions of the kernel of Mesa and, and Wayland. So you need to be on the bleeding edge there. <laughs> uh, yeah, and the, the backends that you can use are mainly the RDK Wayland backend. I've, I was told it work, it's working, but I haven't tested it yet. I, I use the FDO backend. And, um, and for playback, you can use the video for Linux plugin. I use some patches that are still in Bugzilla, I think, uh, for the GL DM above upload support. But besides that, um, upstream mainline works out of the box already. Uh, yeah. OK, so that's it. Thank you for, for listening. Um, if you have any question or anything to, to ask, uh, I will be happy to answer. What is the difference between the RDK and FDO backend here? So the question about the RDK and FDO backend. So historically, the RDK backend was first, and it was developed for other people. And uh, it was, um, yeah, it was, I think it was the first uh, WP backend being developed. And then we decided to, to, to use the, the free desktop uh, stack. And also the, the RDK backend, I think, doesn't work on normal desktop systems. So yeah, but it's, it, they provide similar use cases. But the most, of the most recent development has been done on, on the FDO backend. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that LaPartic is a uh, feature complete explicitly. Are there features that you miss in LaPartic C, then, for example, that you could find in LaPartic C? OK, so the question is about LibWebRTC features uh, that are not part of uh, WebRTC bin. Uh, so the support in, in, in the LibWebRTC backend currently is, um, is not feature full yet. So we missed some features related with the the canvas and web audio support, like plugging between themselves the web audio backend with uh, web, the, the web RTC backend. So that's not fully working yet, so we are still working on that. But the basic thing works. You can use uh, app RTC, and, uh, and uh, it's working already quite well. And um, all the networking stuff being done by the web RTC should at some point, I think, be uh, moved to the network process, but we can probably do that later. And it will be also an interesting thing to, to support for WebRTC bin, like we being able to uh, redirect the, the, traf the network traffic to a specific process. Uh, it will be interesting, I think. Uh, yes. Yes? So you stated that the support for MSC work is in approximately stable. Any plans for uh, 2019 for MSC? 2019? So yeah, I, I had to plan two, two things, the um, multi-track support and uh, for Playbin 3, uh, which is not working yet. And the other one was, uh, which one was it? Yeah, Playbin 3 and multi-track support. So uh, we have basic applications like YouTube already working, um, but they don't use all the features of the spec. So 
there's some still some some gap to fill there. And uh, if I may, what about EME? Any plans to yeah. So EME, we have the basic infrastructure for EME in Upstream WebKit. Um, we have a, a decryptor implementation that can be auto plugged by Playbin. And we have ClearKey support, but ClearKey is only for testing. You don't use that in, in production. Um, so yeah, we have, you have to have um, some downstream changes if you want to support some specific uh, decryption backend, such as uh, PlayReady or Whitevine. Um, but yeah, the, we have the infrastructure in place at least. And, uh, but there are no plans to support this, not even the So I, I'm aware of some people that have uh, some changes in downstream WebKit, and they have EME working uh, for, for PlayReady, I think, and Whitevine. But in upstream, the situation is not clear yet what we should do because of the complexity of the DRM stuff being supported in, in open source projects, it's, 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 uh, it's a complicated topic. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think we're done. Thank you.